musical linguistic objects. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And with me today as virtual hosts are Michael O., Roman S., Leon M., Jennifer M., and Anatole L., all of whom have either paid for a copy of my Pay What You Can audiobook, my novel The Genesis Generation, or uh, they made a direct donation to the salon to help offset some of our expenses. And uh, I thank you all ever so much. And uh, four other people I want to thank are the four adventuresome souls who bought a ticket to the workshop on Orcas Island that Bruce Damer and I were planning on giving at the end of this month. And yes, you heard me correctly when I said we were planning. Because as much as it pains me to do so, I'm sorry to announce that we have had to cancel this event. As you might guess, with only four weeks left and only four tickets being sold, well, it, uh, it, well, it appeared to be a losing proposition where we couldn't even cover our expenses. So I sincerely apologize to you four wonderful people who were committed to attending our workshop, and I hope that one day we can find a way to make it up to you. But for now, it looks like I'll only be coming to you here in the salon and uh, not in person any time this year. However, if you live near Portland, Oregon, there is uh, another workshop that same weekend that you may be interested in. It's being led by my good friend and fellow podcaster and all-around brilliant person, Neil Kramer. Uh, His workshop is titled Walking the Sacred Path, and I'm sure that it's going to be fantastic, as is uh, all of Neil's work. So you might want to go to Neil Kramer, N-E-I-L-K-R-A-M-E-R, neilkramer.com, and uh, check out this event, which runs from September 30th through October 2nd. So, where are we now? Well, instead of uh, finishing my notes for this podcast, uh, I have to admit that I've been watching a lot of the live Ustream video from the playa at Burning Man. I wish I could turn it off and get something else done around here, but it's hard to do when you're feeling a bit homesick about not being able to make the festival this year. And after seeing the size of the temple this year, I'm definitely planning on watching it burn on this Sunday night. And for my burner friends who are listening to this podcast a week or a month or so after returning from the playa, well, I hope you had a great burn and that we uh, get to meet in Black Rock City next year when I plan to be there for sure. But enough of me pining for the playa, so uh, let's get on with today's program. And uh, then, of course, I'll be back to uh, watching John's live stream from the playa. (laughs) But uh, that said, uh, I do want you to know what a treat we're in for today. Because we're about to hear what, to me, is the best, most intimate, and most revealing conversation I've ever heard of the discoverer of LSD, Dr. Albert Hoffman. And it begins with the uh, greatest call-waiting moment I've ever heard. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I've always disliked the call-waiting feature on today's telephone service. Very rarely will I click over when a call comes in while I'm talking to somebody else because, well, I find it extremely rude. But let me ask you, if you had Dr. Albert Hoffman on the phone after trying for weeks to get him to do an interview, would you ask him to hold while you took another call? (laughs) Well, uh, Peter Gorman does exactly that, and as you will hear in just a moment, it was a timeless moment. And uh, that's the only hint I'm going to give you about the caller. But I do want to let you know that uh, I have edited out several minutes of their conversation, uh, the conversation between Peter and Dr. Hoffman, uh, right a- after the uh, call waiting interruption. And what I edited out is a lengthy discussion about whether Dr. Hoffman was to be paid for the interview, as apparently was his custom. Uh, and actually, uh, several friends advised me to leave out the entire section because, well, it doesn't exactly show Dr. Hoffman at his finest. But I left the heart of their discussion in uh, simply because I think it's important that we all keep in mind that uh, everyone, uh, even the great Albert Hoffman, is human and has a few character traits that we might not expect in one of our heroes. 
The point I'm trying to make is that even with our failings, uh, each and every one of us can still be great in our own ways, and that even the great ones among us are humans, uh, complete with their own unique set of quirky character traits. Now, before I forget, there are three important thank yous to pass along in conjunction with today's program. The first two you've been hearing for several weeks now, and those go out to the interviewer, Peter Gorman, who I'll have a little more to say about later, and to Hector Glass, who digitized these old tapes for us. However, this particular tape and a few others were so badly damaged by the Texas heat in which they'd been stored that I could barely make out what was being said. And as you know, I asked for help in making them listenable, and uh, several people, including Roman P., who did the best job, uh, took a stab at it. And uh, as I said, he had some very promising results. But the person who did a really incredible job of cleaning them up, the one that you're going to hear right now, in fact, was my dear friend, Amara Angelica. And while Amara may be a little surprised to hear me call her my dear friend, seeing as how we've only met in person one time, but that is how I always think of her, since it was Amara who wrote an article in the 10th edition of Mondo 2000, in which, uh, for the very first time, I learned about a substance called DMT, and of a man named Terrence McKenna. Had she never written that story, well, there's uh, a high probability that you and I wouldn't be sharing this moment right now. You see, at the time I read her story, I was living alone in Florida, and actually I only knew one other person who was using psychedelics, and uh, mainly magic mushrooms, which we found on his farm. (laughs) In fact, uh, we pretty much thought that we were the last two guys of our age who uh, were still smoking pot and using mushrooms. That's how isolated that I've become, and uh, so I do understand what some of our fellow saloners are talking about when they report that they haven't been able to find any of the others in their local area. It's a really lonely feeling, and back in 1993, when I read Amara's story, and, uh, by the way, the same year that this interview we're about to hear took place, well, there was no World Wide Web or podcasting to let us know that we weren't alone. And so I guess this is a long-winded way for me to once again thank Amara for both leading me to the others and for doing an incredible job of fixing some audio files that otherwise might have been lost forever. Uh, You're the best, Amara. Thank you ever so much. And one more thing I kind of feel compelled to add is a little tidbit for what seems to be now our weekly synchronicity watch. First of all, I read that article about Terrence, uh, it was in Mondo 2000, issue number 10, which came out sometime in 1993, and that's the same year that the interview we are about to hear took place. So there's a chance that I was reading Amara's story at about the same time Peter was interviewing Dr. Hoffman. And on top of that, if you're a listener to the great podcasts on the Cannabis Podcast Network at dopefiend.co.uk and uh, and or participate in the growreport.com's forums, you know that uh, one of the cornerstones of both those efforts is the work of someone we only know as Xandor, which, by very neat coincidence, is the pen name that Amara used for the article about Terence that eventually led me to the tribe. Uh, It's kind of interesting, don't you think, that uh, all these paths are intersected here today? Or maybe you don't, I guess, but uh, I have to admit that it all does really tickle my fancy. And if your fancy is like mine, it can use all the tickling it can get. (laughs) So, uh, enough of me rambling on. Let's uh, get on with the show, huh? First of all, uh, I do want to point out uh, in advance what a magnificent job... Peter Gorman does in interviewing Dr. Hoffman. I don't usually do interviews uh, in the salon here myself because I've come to the conclusion that I'm not very good at interviewing people. You see, uh, the sign of a good interviewer is being able to keep quiet, and uh, you know me, I love to talk. So I pay close attention to how a professional does it whenever I can. And you may come to a different conclusion, but for me, The way Peter handles what could have become a very contentious interview and turns it into a friendly conversation in which he lets his guests do almost all the talking, uh, I think is world class. I can guarantee you that if I'd done this interview, I would have started talking during some of Albert's longer pauses. And as you're about to hear, that would have been a mistake. 
And after we hear this conversation, I'll be back to tell you a little more about Peter Gorman. But first, here is Dr. Albert Hoffman speaking with him sometime in 1993, at which time Dr. Hoffman was uh, about 87 years old. Yes, Peter Gorman. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, explain me again, uh, what magazine uh, are you working for? High Times magazine. High Times? Yes. And the people that have already spoken to me for this, just so you're comfortable, include Oscar Janik, John Beresford, Stanley Graf, Sasha Shulgin, Ken Kesey, Nina Graboy, Laura Huxley, Stanley Krivner. You have all the uh, whoops. To give uh, interviews. Sorry? The, all these have already accepted to give interviews. They have already done interviews with me. Already done. This is finished. All of these people are done. Stephen Gaskin. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's 30 people that have finished interviews with me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and more people have promised, but these are the ones that are... Honest to God, in there, finished, and I could send you the tape recordings. This is not... Uh, pardon me one moment, okay? okay? Sorry. Hello? Hello, is it Peter Gorman? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. This is Laura Huxley. Hello, Laura. You know, I... Can I call you... I'm, I'm on the phone with with yes. uh, Albert Hoffman right now. Oh, yes. Well, I've been giving my best. So okay. You call me that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Hello? Yeah. Yes, that was Laura... Huxley, yes. and she says, please give Albert my best. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> People, uh, they know my work, and they know that it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to draw a fair picture of uh, a fair history of from the people, hopefully like yourself, but up through um, some of the more modern workers, Richard Doblin. I just got off the phone since I spoke to you last with Ronald Sanderson in England, mm-hmm. and he spoke with me for 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, Richard Schultes is a friend of mine because of my work in the Amazon. And I know, and I know you I have know. done a lot of work. I, that's one of the things I would like to talk to you about. So, okay. it's okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, do you pay them Dean, for the interview? Uh, not, not normally. The magazine is not uh, is not, is not an organi- an, uh, an um, non-profit organization. It is a profit organization, a Time Magazine, and you are also paid. Well, this is and High Times Magazine. Not, I should not interview be paid. But you are so important for me to talk to that I would be willing to make an exception. And if I can afford it, I will pay you from what I'm getting paid. My entire payment for the story will be $300, and my phone bill will be 750 or $800, and that's okay, because I want to do the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it with your proposal? What did you propose? I have no idea, just I brought this question up to, because, uh, yes. Um, let's say I can personally afford 250 American dollars. Oh. Oh. And the rest would be paid the, the, the magazine. No, that's what the magazine, I mean, in other words, they would say, we're paying you $300, Peter, so you take $50 for yourself and $250 for Mr. Hoffman. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, let's, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is, I mean, uh, is that mean okay? And I should, uh, I, I don't, I don't mind. I'm just, um, um, I gave an interview, it was some years ago, they paid me $1,000. That was the uh, only magazine. Maybe it was a more rich magazine than we have. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's say $500, okay. Okay, I'll try to clear $500. Yeah. Let's start. Okay. Uh, start uh, a, a brief summary uh, about your work with Sandoz and why you ended up synthesizing LSD. What were you working on? 
I was working in the ergot field, and that ergot is a, a mushroom, which contains many, many interesting substances, alkaloids. And uh, I, in this work, I uh, planned to synthesize an, uh, uh, synthesize uh, a stimulant of for the for circulation. The circulatory stimulant. For blood circulation. Blood circulation, yes. yes. That was the idea. Because, and then, uh, I had, at the model, uh, I had was coramine. That was already a famous and a very good circular stimulation. It is, was coramine. Mm-hmm. And coramine is Nicotinic acid diethylamide. Mm-hmm. Nicotinic acid diethylamide. And because lysergic acid, with which I was working, has a similar structure as nicotinic acid, I expected that because nicotinic acid diethylamide, diethylamide was a uh, circulatory stimulant, stimulant, I expected that a lysergic acid, diethylamide, would also be an, uh, an, um, an, um, a circulatory stimulant. Mm-hmm. Yes. That was, that was the plan. Right. And so, what happened? And, um, this, as it is the rule, this substance, lysergic acid diethylamide, which I synthesized the first time in 1938, was given to the pharmacological medical department for testing. But we did not find anything special. Just the, the animals which they were used for the tests became in the... Um, they were giving them to sleep. What is that? They were hypnotized animals. The hypno- the, the, the it was a hypnotic on the animals. No, it was. The animals, when they are tested for something, they are, they are, um, they are uh, even tranquilized or something like that. I see. And then they became, uh, that is not important. An animal, in any way, uh, they did not find something special. This is compound and that. Uh, Further research was stopped in the in the medical department with mm-hmm. this substance. Right. But uh, five years later, in 1943, I decided to um, prepare a new batch of LSD in order to uh, give it to the, to the medical department for a more extended testing, because in the, in the meantime. Uh, new tests were developed. And I had, for the very beginning, the impression this substance must be something special. I don't know why, it's just the feeling that you have uh, when you are working and preparing uh, substances. And uh, so I uh, had the intention to give it again to this uh, medical department. And then I was... Uh, Working with, this, with in the synthesis at the end of the synthesis when I was crystallizing the lysergic acid diethylamide in the form of a tartrate in the soluble salt, uh, I uh, went into a very strange uh, uh, feeling of uh, of, uh, of um, a dreamlike feeling, everything changed, the, <laughs> the forms and uh, everything had another meaning. It was, it was very agreeable. I uh, went home, lay down, and by, with closed eyes, I had a, a very, very stimulated fantasy. I could just think something and then throw the pictures. It was wonderful. <laughs> And but I and uh, I did not know uh, what that 
what was the reason of this strange uh, experience. I had not ingested anything, I had not taken anything, and did not know what was the reason. And uh, really I had used a, a, a compound, something like chloroform, in this synthesis. And uh, I thought that maybe some vapors of this compound, it was dichloroethylene, which I've been used, that could have been the reason. And then, uh, three days later, I, I um, inhaled some of the solvent, but nothing happened. And then I thought, maybe that I got, by some strange way, some of this diathermate in my body. And I decided to, to make a, a self-experiment to, to, to get up to the... To, to, to ask, to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, I made a solution with five milligrams, but I started then taking an, uh, an equivalent only corresponding to a quarter of, um, of a milligram. How many micrograms is that? 250 micrograms. Okay. And uh, immediately, or not immediately, after half an hour, Similar Did you inject this or drink it? That was in the water solution. So it was to drink? Water solution, yes. Yes. Sorry. Please continue. And, uh, and, um, similar symptoms occurred as, as when I, which I had three days before, but immediately, and very soon to become very, very strong, very intense, and, uh, I became anxious and I uh, uh, asked my laboratory assistant to uh, accompany me home. And then we uh, went home by bicycle because it was war time and, and uh, of course I had no, no car. And, and um, at home then... Um, How was the bicycle ride? Yes, the bicycle ride is just strange. It takes such an important place in the story of LSD. I wonder why. But, uh, I could have, uh, I reported on this bicycle ride in my reports about, my, my report about these experiences. I, I reported about this bicycle ride because I had the feeling that the time would stand still. It was a very strange feeling I never had before. This uh, a change in the experience of life, of time. And therefore I mentioned it. And uh, uh, the sense that this bicycle ride, which is about, uh, about six kilometers from town to the little village, what thing, uh, I found such an interest in the, in the, in the, um, in the mass media. Yeah. I don't know why. But, and I'm saying, uh, that was, uh, the most characteristic thing. I was deep already in, uh, in France, in LSD, uh, uh, in liberation. But one of these characteristics just on this bicycle ride was that the feeling not coming from the, from the place and uh, to be out of no time, no no feeling of time. Marvelous. And then at home, I asked my my uh, assistant to ask for a doctor. My wife and children were out by their parents at that date, just in another town. And um, I asked also the, uh, the my assistant to ask for milk as a neighbor, because milk uh, is known as an antitox antitoxic in general. Mm -hmm. And but I was in a very very old state of, of, of consciousness. 
I, uh, the outer world had changed. Things, um, in the room seemed to be full of life, inner life. The colors had changed in more in, non intensive. And, uh, I had also the feeling of to be myself changed, my ego had changed. And then it became such a uh, strange experience that I, that I had a fear to have become insane. And uh, sometime in the, the, the climax, I had the feeling to be already out of my body. And in the meantime, the doctor arrived, he tested my blood pressure in the test, made the tests and he shook the head and did not find anything abnormal, with the exception that my pupils in the eyes were enlarged. But nothing. And, um, Did that calm you down, knowing mm -hmm. that? Pardon? You say that you were a little bit frightened about having gone insane. When the doctor said you were good, did that calm you down? No, then I had the feeling to, to die because I had no more feeling in my body. I had the feeling to be already out of the body. I see. And uh, the, I could not explain to the, uh, to the doctor. He uh, explained him. I could, sometimes I could really uh, uh, speak rationally and explain him and I had made an experiment could not understand that. He broke me in, 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 the, bed, in, the, in the bed and uh, uh, stood with me. And then after a um, very, very terrible experience, it was very an horror trip, after about, let's see, about four or five hours, it began to change. I had a feeling to come from this very, very strange of the world back to our, uh, our, uh, normal, wonderful world. I, I, I had this feeling that, uh, the, when I came back to this strange world, that our world, as we our normal world experience, which normally we don't uh, just think it would be something wonderful, I had the, the feeling to come back to a wonderful world. I had a solid light in the new, in the new light, and uh, it's kind like what a kind of uh, to be to uh, reverse to reverse again. But that happened then only, uh, this very happy feeling was at the end. But when I came back, uh, the first thing was that, uh, I had very beautiful colored vision. But then I, of course, I lay down and I had the eyes closed and I have beautiful visions. Every, and was very, very strange, uh, this, the transformation of every sound in optical figures. Uh, some noise uh, uh, produced a uh, corresponding colored figure. And um, I, I could enjoy this. And finally I uh, slept, I get to sleep, and in the morning I awake, uh, awake uh, completely fresh. And uh, really then I had the feeling to see the world as it was fresh and wonderful and uh, the very first day. Mm. Then I re wrote all these things down for uh, the, uh, the head of the, of the pharmaceutical department, Professor Stoll, and to the Professor uh, Rutlin, that was the head of the pharmacological department. And at the very beginning, they did not believe it. They said, you must have, might have something with the 
if the dosage cannot see it is impossible that such, such a small quantity can have any effect. Mm-hmm. But then um, they made uh, experiments also by other people. The, the head of the pharmacological department made an experiment and some of his co-workers and they could confirm the enormous <coughs> potency of the substance. They took only one piece of what I had taken. And uh, they had still very strong experiences. Mm-hmm. Did it, it, did, it, did it look in the test tube or in the laboratory, did it look like it could have this potential or it just looked like it would be not enough to have an effect? I didn't understand your question. Well, you say you were surprised or they were surprised that such a small quantity could have such a strong effect. Yeah. Were they looking at it chemically and saying that the lysergic acid itself should not have this effect? Or they were just generally saying nothing so small could have such an effect? Nothing so small could have any effect. I see. And also today, LSD is the most, most potent substance uh, uh, which had a uh, psychic effect. All the other compounds for, 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 uh, uh, for psilocybin, you need 100 times more. For mescaline, about 5,000 5, more. Five, five, higher dosage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can imagine that with one gram of LSD, you can have 10 to 20,000 doses, one gram, is 20 to, also, 10, 20, 10 to 20,000. If you make a dosage of, uh, 100 micrograms, then it gives, one gram gives you 10,000. Or if you use only a normal dose, that means 50 micrograms, which you use in medicine, then it, then you can make from one gram, uh, 20,000 doses. Mm-hmm. And that is absolutely uh, out of all the other compounds you you use. What you have, for example, all the toxins, uh, strychnine or, 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 uh, or uh, what other, many, all the, they, they use milligrams, always use always milligrams. And all the other, uh, all the other, Psych- uh, psychiatric uh, medicaments you use always in milligrams or even in, in centigrams. Mm-hmm. And therefore is why you, <laughs> you never read in the newspaper that they got uh, grams of LSD and all, in general it is so, so many doses, hundred doses or thousand doses maybe. A thousand doses of 0.1 gram. Right. Uh, but in general, the, the, in, the, in, in the black market, this also uh, the, uh, the one speaks about about doses, doses, and not in grams or in kilograms with, with hashish or with then with, with cocaine or so on. It's quite an extraordinary uh, uh, property of LSD, and it has a very, very deep meaning. Uh, pharmacologically, because it means if you have such a uh, deep effect on the whole body of your consciousness, of your uh, 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 of your senses, of your seeing and hearing and everything, it means that it, LSD must attack the very center of our consciousness, the very center where all these things come together, and then. If you go to the center, you can have effect with very small doses. Mm-hmm. And that has, uh, it means LSD works very specifically, specifically, very specifically on, uh, the, uh, on our brain. It works on the very center of our, of our psychic, uh, 
Now, when we talk of LSD and the experience, uh, this is perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself, but it, it LSD ended up in the hands of psych, uh, psychiatrists and psychotherapists, and it also ended up in the hand of kids <laughs> like me 20 years ago. But um, is your belief that when it hits, I mean, do you have a belief that it is simply a physical, uh, something which stimulates a physical part of the body, or do you have a belief that it does something even more in terms of putting us in tune with, I don't know, an, the altered states of consciousness? Uh, I am um, sh- sure it, it is. Um, it stimulates uh, uh, our consciousness and changes our consciousness. That is the most important thing. And and the body eff- bodily effects are very very little. And uh, LSD is not toxic compared with uh, if you if you. Compare the effective dose to the toxic, to the, the lethal dose. That is the, the range which you say something is toxic. Uh, uh, you need this range between the effective dose and the lethal dose. Mm-hmm. And we know this relation. We don't know. People have had hundred times the active dose and they did not die. Nobody has died from the toxic doses of LSD. Not one case. All the cases, the, 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 the fetal cases, was by accidents due to the disturbances of the consciousness of the, the senses. Right. And uh, <clears throat> it is also very interesting. As I mentioned, the, the people in uh, our pharmacological department working with the animals, they did not see any special effect on animals. Because an LSD works only in on very high uh, spiritual centers and consciousness, mm-hmm. which animals not have, seemingly not have. You need very high doses, and then you see in animals, and you can see um, um, not on the central nervous system, or just on the um, what is that the name the. Um, the parasympathetic or sympathetic or the or or, uh, or the uh, or the mm, on the peripheral on the peripheral system like, uh-huh. on animals you only see this effect which you also see in, in humans but if you have all very little li- little doses you don't see it uh, it has no importance and therefore it did not. Uh, they could not uh, they think it was not nothing special, and indeed, uh, it uh, that proves that LSD works on really on our very um, uh, very uh, core, or what do you say, the center of our being. Of the consciousness, which is of course consciousness. Now, how did LSD begin to be utilized by psychologists and psychiatrists? How did how did that happen? Uh, we immediately knew that it is a very important uh, instrument in psychiatry, and we made then in in Sandots, with uh, in, in the pharmacological department and in my department, the chemistry department. We made the first uh, uh, supervised and uh, experiments with volunteers uh, and with tests, with psychological tests. And then, based on this, we asked, uh, it went in psychiatry for the first psychiatric uh, investigation to the sun of my boss at that time, to the son of Professor Stoll, it went to Werner Stoll, who was at the psych- psychiatric clinic in Zurich. And he made the very first study, psychiatric study with LSD, giving it to a normal person, 
to different kinds of mentally ill persons, and it was a very important, a fundamental uh, investigation. I think with all the important uh, facts he already discovered. Uh, and then, based on his first paper, which appeared in in '47 in the Swiss Psychiatric Journal, uh, based on these uh, standards, distributed then LSD with a, with a, with a label Delusit Delusit to to uh, investigators. And uh, with a leaflet, with all instructions, uh, based on his first uh, investigation by, by Werner Stoll. And then it was uh, it uh, found an enormous interest worldwide for many years. It started in the, at the end of the 30s and in the 50s, and I think many thousands of publications appeared in, in, in medical journals and, uh, and everywhere, and all things went well. But certain then in the United States, it, same thing happened. Well, now, tell me about, if you will, when these papers began to be published and people realized its importance and how close and, and how immediate to the core this substance worked. You know, there have been a lot of books written about the Central Intelligence Agency deciding to use it as a brainwashing tool. Now, as a chemist, and as the man who synthesized this, what were your feelings about them doing that? Uh, I was not happy about the call that uh, the um, people of the um, war, uh, the army, of the army laboratory were interested in this substance. But was they, it, and let me just say, was it only the United States or was it also Germany and or... Spain? No, I have been, I heard uh, that also um, in Russia studies were made with this substance. But I was not so, uh, I think the title of these publications of uh, the army and of the American, of the American uh, army journal, I don't know exactly how it names, is that was war without death. It, it, we can, instead of killing our uh, enemies, we incapacitate them, incapacitating drugs to believe. And in this case, it would not be so bad. Uh, if, but that is not that there are other means, but it does not uh, function because uh, you need the right dosage, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, experiments, the many experiments were made in the army that is known and published. I think you find these things also in this new book, or the book of uh, which came out. Uh, what is the name? Storming Heaven? Storming Heaven. Yes. I just wanted to hear your opinion on it, that's all. Now, uh, when did you begin to work with Richard Schultes and uh, Wasson in related, you know, in the field? I know you've published and I've cited you in some of my papers from mm -hmm. the jungle. Uh, did you did you begin to travel with Schultes? Yes, <coughs> it, <coughs> the, um, it started this interest, um, I got in contact with, first with uh, Professor, with, with uh, Mr. Watson, mm -hmm. and that was because, Watson, you know, this is the man, of course, and he, uh, was so um, enthusiastic about our work here because before we had this, the chemical and pharmacological uh, pharmacology solved the problem, he, he his colleague did not believe him that he has some um, visions. He is a, a spinner or something like. And when we had this, 
the substance and at all uh, seen that the mushrooms really, uh, uh, yes, wasn't what was, uh, was uh, you know, working with the mushrooms. Sure. And nobody did believe him. And then the mushrooms were investigated uh, in, uh, in, uh, what was it? Uh, in uh, Merkshark Dome, in the laboratory of Merkshark Dome, and in, in, in the university, um, university of, uh, oh, you can read it in my book, because in science it's, it's data, uh, in other university, and also in uh, the University of, uh, of Paris. Professor Hein gave it to the chemical laboratory at the University of Paris. But they did not find anything. They were not able to isolate the active principles. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Professor Heim in Paris thought that something in, in the lab in Basel, they have a substance which has, makes us have, produces the same psychic effects. And maybe that they have experienced to solve this problem. And so he asked us if we would be interested to uh, investigate the mushrooms. And uh, then we could solve the problem. And interesting enough, I must <laughs> tell this story. Uh, why had we success very soon uh, in opposite to the other labs? Because we tested the extract. You need a test for isolation process, procedure. We tasted the extracts on ourselves. <laughs> we ate the extracts. And because in animals you don't see anything. And Professor Moore in Delaware was the man who worked also. Professor Moore in Delaware University. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he tested it in animals, all kinds of animals. But they did not see effects. Then we were able to concentrate, extract, and finally crystallize, and finally make structure and uh, the synthesis. And uh, then Professor Wosten <coughs> was so enthusiastic, he came to Basel to visit me in my lab, and I showed him the crystals. And he, of course, he as a banker, he was, uh, he did not know what that means before, he said uh, that mushrooms are active, but what I showed me here, and uh, I could explain him, and he was very happy. And uh, and then he said, "No, there is another, another um, magic uh, plant in Mexico used by the Indians, which is not yet investigated chemically, and that is Ololupi." And then that was, I, I'm sorry, what? Ololupi. Okay. Ololupi. Okay. You find it also in my book, Olo uh, And uh, this uh, is not investigated, and you should also start to investigate this. And then I studied the literature about what was known on Olo and then I found a uh, uh, publication by Dick Schultes about Olo He described it botanically. The botanical identification of all nuclei, the seeds of some morning glory mm -hmm. species. And then we met, I, I uh, got the literature by, by him, and then on a congress on medicinal plants, we met the first time in Berlin in what, about 19, maybe about 1960 or so. Uh, so I got uh, also in contact with Dick Schultes and that then good friends and we worked together and uh, he made also published two books, you know. The, yes, uh, I cited them. The and Chemistry of Hallucinogens and Plants of the Gods. And this was then we uh, made uh, an, um, ex an, an expedition to uh, in the Mazatec country in search of Another, another uh, magic plant, uh, which we finally could collect the plant, and that was Salvia divinora, a Salvia species. But uh, this, uh, it is not yet solved the problem. It seems that it is uh, it contains a principle which um, 
is easily destroyed and uh, the Indians use the press that the, the, that's this uh, juice which you can press the plant to get the juice and they drink this juice and have then have then visions and uh, and the name of this plant was one more time Saldia divinorum Saldia divinorum you find it also in my right I just want to get it right so I can look for the proper thing yeah yeah Salvia diminorum. It was an, an unknown species. We brought samples from this expedition, and then in the in the Harvard Botanical uh, Department, uh, it was identified. It, it was described as a new species that they gave a new name, Salvia diminorum. Uh, that means uh, the, the, the salvia of uh, the the. Um, of the, of the gods, Divini, what to be the gods. And I, it is not quite a, a, just the right name. I, I would have said Salvia Divinatorum of the, of the Forsayers more than of the gods. But the, the, plant, the name is now in, uh, in, the, in the scientific literature as Salvia Divinorum. Did you try it when you were in Mexico? Uh, no, we tried it. Uh, I got, uh, no, now, uh, yes, yes, we tried it. In we Mexico, it. and did it yes. work in Mexico, was it? We tried, yes, 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 it was a wonderful uh, experience. It was a long thing, we finally we got an, uh, a shaman, and, uh, who, uh, who uh, it was a woman who could uh, provide and uh, make a session with this. And, uh, and uh, Dick, uh, uh, um, Gordon, Gordon, my wife, and I, we took, we could get this. We had uh, very smooth, smooth, but uh, vision, some optical vision with closed eyes. Mm -hmm. And then... Was I, this similar to, to the LSD, but and milder? Then, and then I, uh, I isolated these principles, and it was... Not, not of the salvia. I must go back to the to the the salvia is uh, what we found then that was the, the third uh, drug. But before uh, I had investigated the, the, the seeds, the oloyuki, and that is very important now. In the oloyuki seeds, which I got, uh, which I got uh, via Gordon Wilson from a Zapotec Indian, we found as active principle, listen good, lysergic acid amide, very closely related, of course, to lysergic acid diethyl amide. <laughs> that means that that was an extraordinary uh, uh, result. Nobody did believe it because uh, uh, lysergic acid derivatives were, had been found only in, in and fungi in very low, uh, in primitive plants. And, in, and uh, but uh, oloyuki are the seeds of flowering plants. And that is a very uh, ex an, an, uh, exception that you find the same active principles in fungi and in flowering plants. And this lysergic acid amide and lysergic acid hydroxyamide, which we find to be the active principles of oloyuki, uh, shows us that LSD is not just a laboratory product. It is closely related chemically and pharmacologically, psychologically, with Oluyukbi, with this old Indian magic drug. That means that LSD belongs uh, pharmacologically, chemically, to the group of the sacred magic plants of Mexico. That's a very important finding. Mm -hmm. And they've made those plants outlawed in the United States now, <laughs> naturally. Okay. Well, what do you mean? Those, the morning, the active morning glory seeds are not permitted to be brought into the United States. They have, uh, they have been used, used, I think tons of uh, seeds have been used in, uh, I say, hippies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it is not very... Uh, 
uh, it tastes very bad and uh, the effect is not so clear with LSD and uh, I think it's no more very uh, often used. But the Indians use it still. The Indians use it still like they use, um, uh, they use mescaline or they use the mushrooms, they use also oral liquid, the Tapotex Indians especially. Right. And that is, I think that is very strange that you find the same uh, this kind of uh, LSD-like, very similar compounds to be the active principle of an old branch of an ancient magic drug. Now, did you ever travel further down into South America or try Yahe or Ayahuasca, San no. Pedro? No, and I've never been more south than Mexico. I see. Um, what uh, what were your feelings once when you were making these discoveries and they began to make it? Well, let's just say when people like Timothy Leary and Ken Kesey began to Ken Kesey with his pranksters and Ken uh, Timothy Leary obviously with tune in, turn on, drop out. What were well, your feelings as, as the chemist who had, who had created this? Was it yeah, good I, or bad? I, I was quite astonished because when I had discovered this very deep uh, uh, um, effects of LSD, which are not at all just a uh, pleasure, it is always a confrontation with our deepest uh, ego, uh, I had the feeling, never believed that would be a pleasure trip to come on the street. Never had believed. And I was quite astonished. And I followed up this development, this very, I think, what, what happened here. And, and I, at the very beginning, I thought that it's very dangerous what now happens in the United States, the began in the States. And uh, uh, then it turned out that my, uh, that my fear was uh, well-founded because so many people were not cautious enough. They did not, uh, they did not respect the deep effects which the Indians have. The Indians believe that you should take the mushrooms only if you are prepared uh, by uh, by praying and by fastening and so. And then only the mushrooms bring you in contact with the gods. If you are not prepared. Then uh, it, it makes you uh, crazy, or or you may even die. That is the belief of the Indians, based on thousands of years of experience. And what happened with the white man? He brings it on the street without preparation, and that was that was the tragedy. If it had been used uh, carefully, then never we had had this scandal, and never LSD would have been withdrawn. Also from uh, the use in, in, in the medical field. But do you think when you now, we, we've gone through one hippie stage, and in fact, almost all of us came out of it all right, right? Yes. I, I do believe most of us came out better, not uh, worse. Yeah, you know, I think also that I, I must confess so many, many people have uh, contacted me and, and confess that they had really very, very important this experience in their life, really. Uh, but, uh, but also thousands have been, thousands and thousands have been uh, uh, brought into hospital, in clinics, uh, because with uh, psychological breakdowns and so on. And, uh, and that was the reason, finally the reason why it was withdrawn from the, uh, uh, from also that, that came that then it was banned and uh, the possession of and and fabrication possession and use completely prohibited and it was of course absolutely uh, an, what do you say uh, an, uh, you cannot understand that this it could happen that is not any logic that if something does uh, by unconscious, by un, unwise use on the streets, you forbid the use in, in the medical field where it never had done any bad. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I, f- I think, uh, of course, uh, LSD, the story of LSD is not yet finished at all. If we uh, learn to use it really as it with respect and in uh, with the right conditions, I am sure the, the, the beneficial effects are enormous. But now we've got kids now, the new thing. That, have you been following? They call it raves or acid house where a lot of kids go dancing for two or three days. I did not hear about this. I don't know. Oh, okay. How about, um... <coughs> not long now. You're being absolutely marvelous. Okay? Thank you very much. Uh, honest to goodness. A few more questions, but you're being fantastic. <laughs> um, in terms of its, uh... uh Street use for people. Some people are going to take it regardless, right? You could stand here all day, and I could write all day. You should use this only in certain circumstances, and you should blah blah blah. And kids will say, "Forget it. I know better," right? Yeah. So, I wonder: is there a simple, simple antidote for people who get a toxic reaction? Oh, yes, but uh, you need uh, you must an injection. You get uh, get the injection with a tranquilizer. But milk did not work, for instance, what? or niacin. They no. used to say that niacin would help, or chocolate, yes, but or milk. No, 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 no. I think uh, um, uh, really tranquilizer, chlorpromazine, or something. It's a very strong tranquilizer, as uh, as uh, what is that? Uh, most. Uh, inject it, that uh, interrupts the, uh, the experience. But it also said that this, um, in psychiatric, in a psychiatric uh, treatment, if there is a bad reaction, it, uh, the psychiatrist said, should, we should not interrupt it. If you have a, a if you care, it will go, uh, it will pass. It is only dangerous if you are in a, uh, in a, let's say in, a, in the discotheque or something like you, you have a horror trip or and so then it is very dangerous and it's important and you could stop it uh, and you could make an injection of a tranquilizer uh, but uh, that is of course, that is known you can interrupt it right no I was hoping that there might be a simpler one for someone who reads this to say who who might do it anyway that we give them an educational tool to help them if they make a mistake. And that it would be because, you know, we can't carry around tranquilizer injection needles. Yeah, so I was try, hoping yeah. something simpler like um, eat three chocolate bars uh, and it will calm you down or, or take three niacin and wait ten minutes and you'll calm down. Uh, but you know nothing of that sort. No, nothing about it. I know only enough that it helps the tranquilizer. But then you actually say you need needles and so on. So you need and the hospital, and the hospital itself is very scary yeah, yeah, if you're yeah, having yeah. a bad time. <laughs> right? And you call, someone calls the police to bring you to a hospital, that would probably make it even worse. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, but the best thing is if it is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is difficult to say, but, um, you know, I have written also um, something then with, uh, and, uh, with Gordon Wasson about uh, the mysteries of Eleusis. Please oh. talk about them, yes. And uh, there we are convinced, and also the people who were working in this field and the problem of elusive, they agreed that they had to use in their holy potion some hallucinogen happy must have been because it could, in, it could induce a vision with hundreds of people at the same time all had the, 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 the potion and that means that something uh, and, uh, and, psych, and, and psychic active uh, ingredient must have been there and uh, that was the problem what could that have been and uh, in any case, we, we had uh, some things, some hypothesis, hypothesis is very good founded, that some LSD-like thing could have been there. Because some um, 
special ergot which grows in the Mediterranean basin in the environment of uh, of Eleusis. There grows an, uh, an uh, ergot which contains uh, the same alkaloids as Oluyukri, namely lysergic acetamide and hydroxyethylamide. And the priest of Eleusis had only to, to pick up these grains of this special ergot and grain it and uh, put it in, the salt, in, in this uh, potion and they had an LSD-like preparation. And that is our, our hypothesis that this was the, the drug of Eleusis. But uh, I mean, and I came by another, I think at, in the antiquity they had institution where people who like to have an uh, initiation could go and uh, had an very well elaborated conditions to have as a, a beneficial effect. But we have not this, we have not. It doesn't exist. Because it may be that some uh, psychiatrists could provide as, uh, the, uh, in all the, in their, if they, if they make their, uh, use LSD as a tool in their psychoanalysis or in psychotherapy that they also prepare um, a setting which uh, a set, a setting which uh, comes near to that which had been uh, even in Eleusis but it's not the same of course in to have it a medical uh, environment or a purely spiritual and that is a, a problem which is not solved in our society. Mm -hmm. I think it is also, it was probably your experience, or you mean not solved. I think the next step should be, and that is the reasonable, uh, reasonable, um, um, uh, reasonable, uh, could reasonably be asked that um, LSD and the psychedelics should be should be available uh, for the in, in psychiatry should be legally available as the doctors have access to morphine they have access to cocaine they have no access to LSD this must be changed that should be changed and as soon and when LSD can also be legally used in medicine, you, it will be possible to accumulate more knowledge about how to use it and, to, and how to get the best of it. But you need a, a legal situation. Mm -hmm. Do you think that those of us like me, um, I mean, do you think it was a grave mistake on our part to use it uh, no, I always took it seriously, but uh, I, I was never took it said like, oh, I should go to a party now. I always thought it should be done in the country with a good friend who was sober, not inebriated with, you know, LSD. Yeah. And I always thought someone was there to take care of me yeah. if anything happened. Yeah. But do you think, looking back 50 years, that it was a mistake for people no. like me to no. have learned? No, not at all. Not at all. We also, here before it was banned, before it was illegal, we made here also officially, and I have described it in my book also with, with writers and with friends, we made these sessions, and, uh, which came very, very, very important. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I finally look back and say it was, uh, it was good that it happened. The hippies period of uh, of uh, American history, I think, is, is, is I think, is very important. And uh, of course, it could have been even better if it not had been uh, used unwise and uncautiously. That was that was that was the uh, I think that was. Um, the, the disaster, and uh, we had bet 
the bad reputation came from all these things which when, when they failed. There were few. There were a few compared with millions which used it in the good way. But uh, these uh, bad cases came to the mass media and uh, gave the, that picture. And uh, yes, I, that is regrettable, very regrettable. We could have had another, another uh, uh, development. Now, are you familiar with Sasha Shulgin and the book Fikal? Yes, yes, I know him. He's an old friend of mine. I think he's marvelous. I like him a lot. Yes, he's in this also, and his wife Anne as well. I, I, I don't know him personally. I uh, I'd never met him. I would uh, like to meet him because I saw him in. It, it, you know that is an uh, an film has been drawn on LSD by the BBC broadcasting. Do you know? No, I don't know this. About some, maybe some six, seven years ago, BBC made the film, uh, twice 40 minutes emission, The Fall of LSD and The Rise of LSD. Mm-hmm. Um, a very good film. And uh, there is a long interview with Kizzy. Very long, excellent. And also very, at the very beginning, the, in the, but they're made uh, the, in... Uh, the, the ex, um, psychiatric experiments were filmed already in the 60s by, in some clinics in, in, in England. All these were in this film. Mm-hmm. And there I only know Kishi from this film. Right. Well, that, that's, yeah, that's the Kesey end. I was thinking more of Shulgin. Um, Kesey is also in this. And he, uh, Kesey was crazy. Fun crazy. Yeah? Crazy? Fun crazy. Ah, uh-huh, fun crazy. Fun yeah. crazy, not, not bad crazy, I mean. Yeah, yes, yes. And yes. he remains very fun and uh, full, full, full of life. Yes, yes, yes. Very. Yes, it's, it's interview also with BBC. He's excellent, brilliant. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, uh, um, but, but, um, I'm, uh, beyond Kizi with, uh, Sasha Shulgin, and the book Fikal, yeah. he, he's giving out some recipes to people, right? In yeah. Fikal. And um, what do you think about some of the new analogs? Have you studied them or experienced and talked about them? Ecstasy, things like that, which, which really are in, as I said, I've never done ecstasy. And I, yeah, don't, I, I don't do chemicals now, but, uh, you know, I'm a little afraid now. I'm getting too old. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm not sure if they're made well, you know? So I don't like to play if it's not made well. Uh, I think this is uh, what uh, the, all these um, new drugs, synthesizers, synthesis the drugs are derivatives of uh, mescaline or amphetamine. Between mescaline and amphetamine, it has no, nothing. It's not like acid gas. It's quite different mm-hmm. in chemistry. The chemistry is different. Both are uh, derived from magic, ru- magic plants of Mexico. Mescaline is in the mescal bottom, the peyote, mm-hmm. and uh, LSD comes uh, from the Ololucli. Uh, and uh, what does she? Um, yes, and the. The uh, derivatives of mescaline, these are the new compounds which uh, Shulgin, Sasha, has made. He has made hundreds of these derivatives of mescaline, combined with the uh, structure of amphetamine, which closely related to, um, to, uh, to mescaline. But they are, um, they are different. I have, I have tried uh, ecstasy, and it is... Um, it seems to me uh, different, and it is, dif- it is different. And uh, pharmacologically also, it is still in, in, uh, in uh, investigation, also toxicity is still uh, investigated. And uh, it is more, it goes not so deep uh, psychologically, it is more an, 
she tried also to give a new name and pathogenic or uh, that uh, that uh, if you have the feeling to to that you must kiss so to embrace the whole world just this uh, this kind of feeling it is not that this dramatic experience is uh, going deep and uh, to the various stages of your psyche is not it is not the same. Mm-hmm. Do but you? It may be, I'm sorry. It may be useful in medicine for certain treatments. I don't know. We have no experience. At this stage, are you? Do you ever continue to experiment on yourself with LSD? No. Well, I took it many years, some years ago. Uh, in a very special, in a very special situation mm-hmm. in Mexico, in the strange, in a, in a full moon. Uh, three years ago, he was in a, with friends in the mountains in south of Mexico, near Jalapa. And uh, in a friend who is, had already experimented with drugs, with a chemist and, and writer, Jonathan Ott. Mm-hmm. And we were in, on the ranch uh, there which he named Oluyukvi. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was a wonderful full moon night, and suddenly we said, now we must take LSD. And there were about uh, six people, seven people. And there, were, there was music there. There are, uh, they had uh, one of the, the, the friends, or the, the, husband, the, the, uh, the wife of Jonathan, is an Indian dancer, so beautiful music, and then we took LSD and we went out in the full moon night, and it was an incredible, wonderful experience. But uh, I believe I don't, I, I don't not need to get uh, new insights from LSD because I got it. I got it, and when I have the insights, I must do what uh, what. Uh, um, uh, what Huxley wrote me in a letter, which I also printed in my book, Huxley wrote me, uh, what you take in by vision, vision experience you must give out and you, in, by intelligence and love in daily life. And that is now the task which I try and, and I, what I, the, the feeling to be a part of the universe, which I got by the LSD experience. So this feeling does not, uh, is always present in, in my life. And therefore I don't need to, to repeat. And it is also the idea of, of, of Huxley when he wrote in his book Islands that three times in life you should take it. And in antiquities he went once to Eleusis to have the initiation and the vision. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessary that it, it could Maybe if you use it for uh, just for for a special experience, yes. But in any case, I cannot understand the people who they, they take it hundreds of times. They take it always, uh, and it is known that it, it, it loses it loses the the effect, the the uh, the potency. potency. Mm-hmm. It loses. Uh, it is also experimental. If you use it daily. So for, uh, just on the fourth day, is that no, no, any effect anymore. On the fourth must, day, you say? Uh, if you use it day, every day, right. LSD, it, it is the second day, it is, it is no more so active, and the fourth day, it's no active at all. You must stop at least one week to have the full activity again. Mm-hmm. That is quite different from all the, the, the other drugs which pr- produce addiction. That is also very, very important. The LSD does not produce anything addiction, no addiction. And that is a very, very big difference, which in general the, the, um, also the um, health authorities don't respect and don't understand. That is a very, very important thing. Then because all the drugs which are, which are a problem in society are, uh, are addiction producing. And addiction is a problem, not one experience with, with, uh, with, mescaline, with uh, heroin, that doesn't matter any, and that's nothing. 
but it is only dangerous because because you can uh, uh, toxicomania, you become addicted and uh, use it uh, and destroy your health. That's uh, such a different, an enormous difference in 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 the in the character of these compounds of these different drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I I couldn't agree more. But I like what you said also about um, that you've already got it. What? I liked when you said you've already got it and you've got the message. Yeah. And now it's a question of learning to bring that message from yourself. Yeah. Um, have you anything to say for... Uh, I mean, this is marvelous. I could talk all day, but... Uh, but uh, this is this is a wonderful interview. Um, uh, is there anything you would like to add? Just no. I hope that uh, one will learn uh, with, with time to use it in the proper way. And I think I am sure it can open new doors of perception. Thank you. And I knew you were fooling when you said your English was not good enough. No, it is. <laughs> it's marvelous. Yes. You have been pretending all these years. But I'm telling you, it's very, very good. It's mm. fine. You, you made yourself as clear as you want to be. No, no. Maybe finally, if maybe that I will learn it finally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Maybe that I meet you sometimes. I would love to. I would like it also. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Peter. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Like you most likely have done, uh, I have read Dr. Hoffman's little book, LSD, My Problem Child where he writes about his discovery of acid. And I've heard him give a couple of speeches about it as well. However, I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, this particular telling of that story in such a casual setting, even though it was over the phone, is the most intimate and wonderful telling of this tale that I've heard. This is uh, simply a story being told by an 87-year-old man about a day in his life back when he was only 37 years old. And while 50 years had passed since that day, it sounded to me as if those events were so permanently etched in his memory that he was telling us uh, how it happened as if we were right there with him in the time. Peter, I can't thank you enough for not only letting us hear this interview, but for the wonderful job you did in drawing Dr. Hoffman out of his scientific shell and letting us hear him as if he were our grandfather and uh, we were hearing the stories at his knee. All I can say is bravo! Now, if you uh, think back a little bit to where Dr. Hoffman mentioned how unhappy he was with the military testing LSD for warfare uses, well, I couldn't help but remember that YouTube video of a group of British soldiers who were given LSD to see how they'd react uh, in battle if they were under its influence. And I've linked to it in the program notes for this podcast uh, simply for the fun of it. In case you haven't watched that yet, it's a uh, minute and a half of good laughs for anyone who has had an acid trip. It ends with the narrator saying, But one hour and ten minutes after taking the drug, with one man climbing a tree to feed the birds, the troop commander gave up, admitting he could no longer control himself or his men. He then relapsed into laughter. <laughs> it's a great little uh, British documentary about two and a half million people have already seen. And my guess is that virtually all of those viewers were, were or are uh, acid heads. And it seems to me that the result of this experiment was uh, actually really positive. All we have to do is dose everyone in every Army, Navy, and Air Force around the world all the time, and we'd never have a war again. But uh, in the interest of keeping a low profile, I certainly don't recommend writing to your political representative and recommend that, uh, at least not yet. 
My uh, final comment about this wonderful interview is that I hope you go back and listen to Albert Hoffman's advice about 47 minutes into the interview, where he talks about how the traditional use of these sacred medicines involves proper preparation and a proper setting for the experience. And, you know, I can't preach here because, as the goddess knows, I, for one, have certainly abused these precious substances in the past uh, myself. I don't anymore. Uh, Now I have these sacred experiences very rarely and never in a party situation, and always with rituals that I've developed on my own primarily and that I don't share, and I do it in private. But that's just me. Uh, Maybe I've become more conservative in my use of these substances because I'm getting old. But I don't think that's it because I have a lot of friends who are psychonauts and we all seem to have gone overboard at first, then become a little more focused and by the time we all had about 20 years or so of intensive use of these substances, well, we all seem to have backed way off. Uh, No matter what our age was at the time the 20 years or so ran their course. But hey, uh, don't go by what I say, I'm just one guy and your experience is going to be unique. All I suggest is that before you decide to try anything, you first learn all you can about it, and when it comes to psychedelics, well, the first place to start, as you've heard me say over and over, is Arrowid.org, E-R-O-W-I-D.org. The people who uh, work on that website are friends of mine, and I'll personally vouch for the integrity of the information that you'll find there, and there are very few places that I'd say that about. Now, one last plug before I go, and that's for Peter Gorman's website, where you can find more information about his recent book, Ayahuasca in My Blood, 25 Years of Medicine Dreaming. Here's what uh, Dennis McKenna had to say about Peter and his new book. Long before ayahuasca tourism became a pastime for rich gringos, Peter Gorman was knocking around Iquitos in the Amazon. He's traveled the rivers and quaffed the brew with the best and the worst of them, and been way, way beyond the chrysanthemum on many a dark jungle night. This is the intensely personal story of an old-school jungle rat for whom ayahuasca is not just a hobby, but a lifelong quest. Well, I don't know how you could get a better review for an ayahuasca book than, uh, than that one coming as it is from a fellow explorer and recognized expert in the field. So if you're looking for an interesting gift to give yourself or a close friend, why not help us support Peter's work as a way of thanking him for these wonderful interviews that he's letting us play here in the salon. Well, that's uh, going to do it for now, and so I'll again close today's podcast by reminding you that this and most of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. And if you have any questions about that, just click the uh, Creative Commons link at the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can get to via psychedelicsalon.us. And if you're interested in some of the stories that may or may not have led you to uh, come to this moment where you and I are sharing a few thoughts together, well, uh, you can read about a few of them in my novel, The Genesis Generation, which is available in Kindle and other ebook formats, as well as a pay what you can audiobook read by me. And you can find out more about that at genesisgeneration.us. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>